That stuff can't be good for you. If they sell them yeah. in 7-Eleven right at the register, it's probably going to die. So what's up, man? I'm so glad you're on this fucking show right now. I got Spencer from Ice Nine Kills on the show for a very special Halloween edition of Drinks with Johnny. I got to say, man, I've just been listening to your new record for a week now, and I'm, I'm not going to pretend like I've known, known about you guys for a long time. I'm just going to be straight up honest. I just now learned about you guys. I knew the name. This is the first album that I've gotten into, and holy fucking shit, where have I been? You guys are fucking awesome. Well, thank you so much for that, dude. It means a lot coming from you. Um, I've been an Avenged Sevenfold fan for a long time, so uh, I'm just stoked that you love it, man. It's so great. I love the uh, the the imagery, everything horror about it. That's why I was like, dude, I reached out to Charlie Besser and I was like, if you can get me someone from the band, preferably Spencer, to be on for the Halloween episode, we got to make this happen right now. Like, because we're, we're going to release this and turn this right around on Monday, which I usually take my sweet ass time releasing these episodes. So. Really excited to have you here, man. Let's get right into the album. Uh, uh, Welcome to Horrorwood, part two, right? That's right. Yeah, uh, I've I've always been a huge horror fan and a, hor- a huge fan of uh, franchises. So I knew that when we did the first one and we had some success with it, that right in line with you know Friday the Thirteenth, part two, the body count continues, Halloween yeah. two, and Scream two, that we we had to follow in the footsteps of the, the slasher gods and do a part two. Dude, it's so cool. I, I heard, I was listening on Octane about a week, week and a half ago, and I heard you on there talking about the new record and playing some songs from it. On And I was like, what the fuck am I listening to right now? And I love the backstory about each track had, a, had, a, had followed a different horror movie. And uh, I hadn't seen the videos yet. I just watched the videos 20 minutes ago, by the way, for the first time. Fucking awesome, awesome music videos and how they tie in together. So cool. Um, but I first was just listening and I was like, man, each song, like you got, you got the Pet Cemetery in there. You got uh, Resident Evil. You got, of course, Chucky with the uh, Batteries song. Uh, fucking, oh, the, my favorite title is Hip to be Scared for the American mm-hmm. Psycho. I mean, that was such a good play on that movie and then having my boy jacoby i'm good friends with jacoby uh shaddix so having him on the song and the then i saw the music video and man he nailed it and even coming up uh with paul right before you fucking hit him and hit him with the axe i mean like the throwbacks and the homage to the movies that you've done is so cool and so obvious that you're a big horror fan and as i said this is a halloween episode so, I mean, I got to imagine, is it just Halloween for you year round or do you, do you do it up a little bit more in October? Honestly, our, our whole lives are pretty much Halloween. I've been into the horror movies and the holidays since I was a little kid. So October is just like that little added bonus, but it's kind of spooky season for us, 365 days a year. But, but then in October, it's like everyone kind of vibes us even more and gets our vibe because everyone loves Halloween around October. So we're always a little bit of, um, ahead of, of, of liking it year round. Um, but I'm glad you brought up the Jacoby cameo because he was awesome in it. And uh, he, I knew he would have the perfect voice for that part. And it was funny because when we were doing the Huey Lewis part, we do like a little interpolation of hip to be square. And uh, you know, we changed the chords and it's a different key, but still because it was close, we had to actually run the part by Huey Lewis. So he had to watch the video and apparently he thought it was awesome and he signed off on it. So it's cool that in the credits it says written by Ice Nine Kills and Huey Lewis. Yeah, I, we, I saw that in the credits. I was going to ask you about that. I'm glad you, you just went right into it. Now I don't have to ask it, but like, that's so cool. I mean, I mean like that, uh, did, you, did you get any inter- interaction with Huey Lewis or is that just all through like lawyer camps and stuff? It was just through lawyers, but um, I think... You know, the, the song initially, when it came out in the 80s, obviously had no connotation or connection with American Psycho or horror or any violence. And then it sort of got this rebirth in 2000 when they put it in the film. And, you know, obviously they talk about it in the book, too, but it really came to the forefront when you actually have that scene, which is so brilliant, like the juxtaposition of this poppy 80s sound with this horrible ax murder. And so I think he was already a little bit softened to the song being, you know, associated with something so violent. So he's like, yeah, fuck yeah, let's do it. <laughs> it was different than being part of Back to the Future. So, I mean, that, 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 that's that got to change it up a little bit for him. 
Uh, I someone noticed, pointed out that cameo. I had no idea that he was in Back to the Future until very recently. I was like, ah, you didn't know that the, all the songs "Hip to Be Square" is played on Back to the Future. Uh, what, what was what was some of the other ones? Uh, well, yeah, Back in Time. That's the that's the power of love. All that was all on the Back to the Future soundtracks. So funny, and, and another connection to, to Back to the Future um, in Biff's game uh, in Back to the Future too. Uh, a very talented character actor named Ricky Dean Logan is in Biff's game and um, he's also in a, a couple episodes of Seinfeld and uh, Freddy's Dead, you know, one of the Nightmare on Elm Street yes. movies. And he plays my lawyer in the interrogation scene with uh, Bill Mosley. Is that, is, that, is that for like the rainy day too? Like where it's exactly. just that, Yeah, that, that, first of all, there's so much funny shit that you guys throw in there when I'm watching back, like all the, all the interludes, the, the ends of the, of the video where they're going back to the, uh, the crime scenes. We'll get into explaining that to those who don't know here in a second, but I just wanted to point out the, those hilarious little lines. Like, was that a director? Did you write all these uh, sketches out? Like how, how did these sketches come about? Like, I understand why they're there to paint this picture and tell the entire story and the concept of this record, but it, more specifically, when you're going to write it, is that something that you're writing? Or are you having a, a, someone's help who's written scripts before? Or where does this come from for you? So before we really started to write the music for the album, I devised a, a movie treatment that sort of encompassed the whole o overarching story that we're going to be telling through the music videos and hopefully a feature length film. And um, this was before any of the music was written. And then obviously during the pandemic, we, we wrote pretty much the entire album. And um, the dialogue scene was written by, the dialogue scenes are written by, by myself and um, a longtime collaborator, you know, a guy I grew up with named Andrew Smith. And um, he takes, um, you know, screenplay writing courses and we just kind of banged it out pretty quickly. But uh, we come from the very same school of thought of you know loving things like horror films but also you know Seinfeld and um the Christopher Guest movies like Best in Show and Waiting for Guffman all that kind of very dry humor and, yeah one of my um, favorite lines along those lines was along those lines that you're talking about is the guy who's getting kicked out by Bill by Bill Mosley is a humor is a subjective and <laughs> that was actually an ad -lib, and um that actor is uh, a guy named James A. Janice who has a very um, popular uh, YouTube channel called Dead Meat James. Oh, where really? He does all these kill cam videos. He's got like 500, like I think 5 million YouTube subscribers. And wow. he interviewed uh, me for a podcast. And um, I just knew he would play this part perfectly. And him and his fiance, actually, Chelsea, are the, uh, the guy and the girl uh, in, in that scene, those two detectives. And even our lawyer, Eric German and our manager, Mike Mallory, or some of the other cops in the room. So we kind of keep it all in the family with Ice Nine Kills. Dude, I and love of it. Of course, Bill Mosley, who, who... I heard Bill Mosley was tied in somehow with a couple of the music videos. And I was like, well, let's check him out. Didn't see it. And at the end, I was looking at it. And it actually, me and my producer were looking. We we're like, that's Bill Mosley. He just doesn't have his fucking beard. Like, <laughs> we're like, oh, yeah. it took me a second. Though. That's that's really cool. How did, the, how did that... Uh, how did that... Uh, partnership or friendship start uh, with, with getting him on the, on the project? Well, I've always been a big fan of his. I, always, I refer to him and I've told him this before as the Charlton Heston of evil. Those wow. like monologues that he does in uh, House of a Thousand Corpses, you know, the kind of like chill inducing, almost like Donald Pleasance level speeches from like Halloween and stuff. So I've always been a fan and we did something last October called the Silver Stream. You know, when everyone was starting to do these like live streams, kind of play on the silver screen. And uh, we had this concert that we had shot uh, at the Palladium in Worcester, this sort of, um, you know, big production, multi angle shot live show that we were trying to figure out, hey, let's tie something in. And so we decided to do this little mini horror movie. Uh, where Bill Mosley was hosting the presentation of this live show. And I thought, you know, maybe we could do it where we turn the Zoom chat between the band members and Bill Mosley into a little mini horror movie. So as we're watching uh, the live show in between the breaks, people, the band is getting kind of knocked off one by one. So uh, we just, we wanted him for the part and we reached out to his representation. 
Um, this really talented guy named Miles directed the Silver Stream. And we just had a great time with Bill and he really liked us. And uh, when it came time to, uh, you know, write the script for the new album, Silver Stream 2, I thought, man, we got to get Bill Mosley to play Captain Harris. And uh, it was fun because Aunt, when Andrew and I were writing it, we had him in mind. Yeah. So we kind of wrote the dialogue around knowing what actor was going to play it. So that really helped. And I thought it would be cool because he's always, you know, a sort of a villainous killer, Bill Mosley. So I thought getting to play the, the police captain was kind of a nice uh, change of character right. for him. And he was into it. Yeah, that's really cool. I love that. I love that how that came together. That's that's really cool. And I've seen you take a couple of uh, pulls off of your bottle of wine. You're a little too classy for the glass. Uh, what what kind of what kind of wine is that you got there? So it's a nice red. It's called Nineteen Crimes: The Uprising. I'm actually at a hotel right now, um, staying with a buddy, and uh, this was the coolest bottle they had. And I thought it was. I mean that. I mean that works. That works for the Halloween episode. I was about to make a drink. You wanna you you wanna uh, hear me out on this drink real quick? I would love to. Please share. So this, so this one's called Death in the Afternoon, um, and it starts with a little bit of absinthe. Pull it off. You get like a quarter to a half shot of absinthe. I'm just gonna eyeball it. That should be about right. And then you just top it with champagne. That's how simple it is. And it's just called Death in the Afternoon, and it's an Ernest Hemingway favorite. That's awesome. Yeah, I just discovered it. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. So I got this champagne that has been sitting in my wine fridge for a little while, and I figured tonight's the today tonight. It's in the middle of the fucking afternoon, uh, and uh, figured this was the time to bring it out. It's from Arnica Cellars in Napa. So. And you said it was Hemingway's choice uh, drink of choice. He has a few drinks of choice. If you follow all of his quotes, he has quite a few drinks yeah. of choice. But this is well, one of them. Well, maybe it inspired some of his greatest works, right? I mean, it does have the absinthe in it. And uh, although the absinthe I have is probably not the same he was drinking, I'm hoping it's going to do the trick, right? Death in the afternoon. I can get behind that. Yeah. Where, where is this hotel at? Where are you at in the world? Uh, I am back in Massachusetts, uh, pretty close to Salem. Um, we're in town because we just did a little surprise show last night in Boston at a little small like punk rock club. We announced the show like a few days before and uh, we've been doing some pop-up shops to promote the new album and meet the fans right in Salem. So there's really no better place to be for spooky season than uh, Sinister Salem. Dude, I was going to say that's so fucking rad. And, and I was going to ask about how fun are those little like pop-up punk shows? Like, like going back to... Like after you've been on the big festivals, had your own big shows, and then you get to go back and have that really tight intimacy and just like only the rabid fans are going to get it because you're just going to release it. Like you said, three days before I've done a handful of those in my career and I'm, I've always had a blast. I want to, I want to know what your take on them were. Absolutely. I mean, to me, those small intimate shows are the coolest. Obviously it's unbelievable to play in front of like 10,000 people, 15,000 people at those big festival shows. Um, and those are, you know, honestly pretty new for us just in the last couple of years. Um, but I always like those super close, intimate shows, no barricade. And, uh, you know, the fans right up sort of like almost theater in the round. We were playing this place called Sonia in Cambridge. And I'm, I'm sure you probably played the Middle East way back in the day in Cambridge. I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I've, I've forgotten a lot of those names, but I'm sure we did. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, it's one of those venues where like the fans can also be on either side. Oh, yeah. it, it's just one of those things where it brings me back to the to the good old days and, and even the way we were rehearsing for these shows um, we were practicing at um, our bassist Joe's parents house which it, it, you know it just brought me back to the high school days the only difference so is cool. you know people know about the band now we're not playing at the VFW yeah <laughs> the VFW did you guys right. have shows at the VFW oh man we were kicked out of pretty much every VFW in the, in the greater Boston area. Um, <laughs> we would get messages from the next the next day of the guy that you know, ran the VFW that he was cleaning up blood in the bathroom for like an hour. You know, oh. It's good, re good reputation building in those days. Yeah, well, I mean, if you end up being a horror band later, it works out. <laughs> oh, of course. And in those, in those little like uh, shows, I know for me, 
when we get to go back and do those more intimate shoes shows not shoes they actually shoes, up, shoes you get you get to put yourself back in those old shoes um but uh for me i like to drink a little bit more heavily during those shows because it's more of a party you're like having a party with your fans what say you on that i mean do you drink during the shows very often uh definitely you know for me vocally i, I like just kind of loosening up with uh, some shots of whiskey before the shows um it got a little out of hand on one european tour um but, you know, I, I seem to sing fine if I'm a little tipsy. It doesn't really throw me too much, but I couldn't imagine um, being, you know, the guitarist or, or, or the drummer or the bassist. You know, your motor skills are a little bit, but, you know, you're a pro. No, no, no. Yeah, fine. yeah, no, no, no. But after, after a while, it just becomes second nature. I always say, and this is, this is the truth, I always say the moment I actually have to think about what I'm doing on stage is the moment that I fuck up. It's got to be so second nature that I'm just having a good time and everything's just flowing. And those are, those are my best shows. Those are my favorite shows. And, you know, not thinking about what I'm doing at that moment at all. The only moment is being there with the fans. That's the moment that I, that I, that I want to feel in every show. But anyways, cheers to being on the fucking show with me right now, brother. Thank you so much for having me, man. Yeah. I was really stoked when I heard that uh, I was going to be on. Likewise, that you were going to be on. I was, I was stoked as well. Because let me get back into this record real quick. And why I have to say, and this is no bullshit. And everyone who knows me personally and probably can even gather from uh, the guests I've had on the show, I like a lot of new rock bands. I like them just fine. Like they're, but it, sometimes, I'm not going to name names, it starts to get a little, they all start to sound the same on, on Octane. Let's be real. And when I'm listening through, and I hear something like your guys' new record or a new single come up on it. I was like, wait a minute, this is putting in some hardcore stuff. Yeah, we got we get the hardcore stuff. We get uh, some of the the uh, not poppier but uh, catchier choruses um, that kind of remind me a little Panic at the Disco ask in some spots. Um, you know, darker of course. Um, but then you got the really cool things I loved when this record came out that sounded fun. There's a lot of the Oingo Boingo kind of bouncy ska stuff that just comes out of nowhere just for a second. And it's just like really fun. And then on top of it, to, to polish it all off, I can hear the intricacy of the band and what they're playing. Really, really great musicianship on this record. And I was just like, and a lot of times, as you know, you meet a lot of bands that try to put all this shit together, right? And they do an okay job. And I'm not talking shit on that, but this is the first time in a long time that I've heard something new that has encapsulated a lot of these different genres. And to me, that's why I'm just such a big fan of this record right now. Well, thank you so much, man. I think, um, and I think our bands both come from originally, you know, we were a punk ska band. And I think you guys have a lot of roots in that, if I'm not Oh yeah, we have, each, each one of us had a punk rock band growing up before we, before we got together and and then did many warp tours and huge fans of all the punk rock dudes. Like, uh, that's, that's like kind of metal was, I guess my first love cause I didn't discover punk until middle school. But then once then it's like metal punk, they're just kind of there at all times for me. A hundred percent. And that's the kind of stuff that I grew up on. You know, I started the band after a gold Finger show. I'm nice. a huge fan of that whole scene, the epitaph scene, and, you know, the last album we had, Less than Jake playing some horns on a part. We've had a real big fish come on stage with us. Um, so I think that we have a lot of influences that maybe not a lot of bands that were necessarily put in the same category have. And um, I'm also a, a huge fan of musical theater, um, you know, Les Miserables and Phantom of the Opera. Those are the kind of things that often I'm pulling from melodically fan of, yeah mel melodically i could definitely hear a lot of fan of the opera i'm glad he said that that that's that's like there's a lot of that like with the i, I don't call them run on uh melodies but they kind of are in a way like they're still super structured but to a lot of layman's it just seems like a, oh this chorus is just it's still hooky but it just keeps going it seems like a run on you know and i feel like yeah. that's a lot of that's a lot of fan of the opera uh, opera shit there no, absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned Wingo Boingo, um, you know, I'm obviously a huge Elfman fan, all the, 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 the scores from the Tim Burton movies and all the old um, classic horror scores like Bernard Herrmann and Psycho and um, Harry Manfredini that did Friday the 13th and John Carpenter. Um, and as I mentioned before, and as you kind of pointed out, 
there's a there's a, an element of tongue in cheek to what we do and not taking ourselves too seriously because uh, you know a lot of these movies, whether they're intentionally funny or not, you know, they are funny and, and cheesy. And so it's it's a little bit of embracing that. And it's always funny when I hear that criticism. Oh, that band is cheesy. It's like, no oh, shit, man. You ever seen these movies? Like you're not going to get it. Um, but I appreciate you saying that, and, and, and it's really cool because you know we were listening to um, a lot of Avenged Sevenfold records. Uh, Drew Falk, our producer, um, would put the records on, and we, we you know we love the snare sound that you guys always had. And when someone mentioned to us recently that like they thought that this was kind of like our city of evil, it was just like such a uh, a high compliment to us. So. It's kind of a serendipitous that we're talking right Dude, now. Dude, I wouldn't disagree. I mean, I, as I said, I, I, I barely have gotten back into your back catalog, and I don't want to come on here and pretend like I've been the biggest Ice Nine, uh, Ice Nine Kills fan from the beginning. That's not what I'm going to do, because it's going to be real. I just heard the fucking new record. So, like, it's fucking awesome, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about. And I want to get to know you more and get to know the back catalog. But, I mean... I don't know much, as I said, I don't know much about the back catalog, so I couldn't compare that and make it your city of evil. But I will say this record is going to blow the fuck up, in my opinion. Like if it hasn't already in the first week, it's going to continue to grow because I'm listening to it, man. I don't hear anything else like it out there right now. Well, that's so nice of you to say. And uh, I'm, I'm really blown away by the reaction to it so far. Like we thought it was great. We thought it was really cool. But um, to see it. Uh, really, you know, connecting with, with the horror and the, and the metal community is just so awesome. And anytime we hear that we've exposed people to, to, um, to certain horror movies, because obviously, you know, on the first album we covered, The Godfathers of the Shot, we couldn't do a horror album without doing you know, Michael Myers and Jason Voorhees and Freddie. But I, I, I really get the kick out of putting some of the more obscure slasher movies that I like, like Silent Night, Deadly Night, about a killer Santa Claus, or My Bloody Valentine on this record. And Did you, have, uh, uh, you had Corpse Grinder uh, guest on that one, right? Yeah, and and that was awesome because we wanted you know tip our hat to uh, you know the forefathers of uh, of gore death metal, and and you know who who more fitting than Cannibal Corpse, right? And right. Just yeah. Slaughtered the performance. Dude, it's a great song. That was one of the ones I heard on Octane. I heard you talking about you. You attribute it to probably your uh, your heaviest song or, or, or most scathing song of some, something along those lines. And I would agree listening to what I've heard. Um, let's get into another couple of the features on this, though, too. Like you had a, a, a good friend of mine, Brandon Saller from Atreyu, on the on the song for the, that, that's the homage to uh, Hellraiser, Pinhead, correct? Yes, and he actually uh, co-wrote the song with us. He uh, provided the chorus melody, and I've always just been a huge Atreyu fan. You know, as soon as you hear his voice, it's just like uh, he's like the he sounds like Pavarotti of uh, metalcore to me. He's got this <laughs> big voice, and um, we did a tour with Atreyu a couple years ago, and, and him and I hit it off. We, we jokingly talk about how we're going to do a side project about um, Spiel, um, Adam Sandler films called Happy Kilmore. Um, so we thought, oh my we thought God, we, you have to do that. That would be, I know. I'll, I'll play bass. I'll come. Yeah, play bass. Dude, let's do it. It'll be a super group. It'd be super fun. It'd be super fun. <laughs> um, and Killy Madison. I mean, there's plenty, plenty of stuff. Oh yeah. Well, we'll, we'll come No, there's enough of them that you could have a different album title for it. We got to come up with the ultimate band title and then you got to have all the albums like that, that come out like that. Dude, the beheading singer. The beheading singer is brilliant. There's the other one. Yeah, see, then, um, then you incorporate some horror into it. See, I knew we'd get along just fine, Spencer. You got that fucking perfect. weird humor. I love it. I love it. Speaking of, going back to that humor, though, real quick, I wanted to point out another thing. It's like, what, what was the line? Something about uh, being a, a, a Jewish metal band or something like that. It, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the, are, you guys, the, are you guys Jewish? Two of us are, yeah. Okay. And, 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 so, and, so I imagine Kiss is a big influence. You got the whole Oh, yeah, thing Gene going Simmons, on. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And... and um, that goes back to Ricky Dean Logan, who says, the only confession that my client will be given is to his priest. And that happens every Sunday. And then, you know, jump over to the other guy. I thought they were Jewish. So <laughs> that, that, that line was actually written by our, our manager, Chris Nilsson, who's got this really witty sense of humor. And um, you'd love him too. He's, he's, he's one of us. Yeah, I love I love everything about it. I just... Uh, it brought, just made me think as you were talking about it. 
So there's like you have four videos so far that you've released that uh, that follow in line with this uh, this concept, right? Are you going to be doing it for every song on the album and follow up on that? Are you filming them all at once? Are you filming a couple at a time, or are you just filming them at, and keep coming back to the same actors? Well, we filmed everything that you've seen so far. Is everything we filmed right now? So okay. we just got to go back to the label. Hopefully, they. Uh, break out the checkbook they've been absolutely phenomenal phenomenal um, i was gonna say interviews. dude i was watching it and we're, me and my producer were watching it and we're like people don't get budgets like this for music videos anymore so obviously they hit the hip and and uh have a little bit of faith in you guys here fearless has been amazing with that stuff um and i can't i, I can't thank them enough um we filmed kind of two of them at the same time but we filmed all of the detective stuff in one day so all the stuff you see with Bill Mosley, all the stuff with Dead Me James and Ricky Dean Logan, that was filmed um, in a studio in uh, in LA. And uh, there's just so many great cameos, obviously all the ones that we mentioned, but um, one of the most ironic cameos, I think in power of music video history, not to toot our words, but I think this is pretty crazy. If you've ever seen the original Pet Cemetery movie, the little kid when he gets hit by the truck gauge, it's like one of the most, to me, one of the most disturbing scenes I've ever seen in a movie. You know, this little kid, this toddler, and the way they shoot it, they show that the power, the enormity of that truck bearing down on this little thing that kills him. So that actor who played the little boy is named Nico Hughes. And he was in so many movies in that era. You know, he was the kindergarten cop. He was the little kid who says the famous line, boys have a penis, girls have a vagina. vagina. Yeah. And Arnold Schwarzenegger. put that like, all together. I mean, I know the kid, like, but uh, so yeah. he's in, he's, he has a so, cameo in your music video? So we got to, we got him to play the truck driver that hits our little gauge. No. So he, essentially he's killing himself. Whole he's circle. killing his own character. So he's such a cool guy and he's so down to do it. And I just thought for horror fans, you know, uh, if they pick that up, they're going to love it. And also, when he goes down to put his drink down in the truck, we put a little shot of a couple of the other movies he's in in DVD cases. So you have Kindergarten Cop <laughs> and uh, uh, Wes Craven's A New Nightmare because he was the little boy in that really cool, my favorite, other than the first one, installment of uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. That so was there's a lot of YouTube favorite. Okay, okay. I, I I go I go for I go for like what is it? I th believe it's Freddy Four when he really starts getting goofy when he's killing everyone, and I really uh, love that. Was it Freddy's Revenge? I believe. I could have been uh, uh, Freddy's Dead, maybe. Maybe it's or, Freddy's uh, Dead. That's not four, but there's Dream Warriors, Dream Child. Dream, uh, it's after Dream Child. I know it's after it, Dream Child. It might have been the one where he he turns into the TV and he and he, right before he smashes. Well, Patricia what? Arquette, he says, uh, welcome to prime time, bitch. Yes. That the, yes. And then he's, he's also a pizza. He's also like the toppings of the pizza later. I've got that action figure. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. So well, that begs the question. We could go into these real quick. I have a few that I wanted to know. Like, we're both horror fans, but in, in just like in every genre, you have your preferences, right? You may enjoy the entire genre, but you have your preferences. So there's like, the easy layup ones is Freddie or Jason for you. Uh, I'm 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 a Jason guy. I love Freddie, but uh, something about that hockey mask and uh, him stalking around the camp. And uh, it's funny because in the original, the little boy, you know, little boy Jason is that yeah. big famous jump scare at the end comes out and drags the girl uh, from the canoe into the lake. Into the lake, yep. That actor is named uh, Ari Lehman. And he actually sings on our song about Jason, the acoustic version. So he sings? That was, he's in a great band called First Jason. It's like sort of power metal band. He plays like a guitar and he's got a really cool voice. And I reached out to him and I, we were doing an acoustic version of our song about Friday the 13th called uh, Thank God It's Friday. And um, he was totally down to sing on it and he delivers a great performance. That's amazing. So there... I didn't realize all that. I did hear "Thank God It's Friday." I heard it on the radio. And that was the. I think that might have been the first song I actually heard from you guys. And I was like, "This is fucking awesome!" And it was like at the beginning of this month or something like that. And that's when I started to learn a little bit about what you guys do. In the again, back to the imagery and everything that you do to tie in this horror stuff is just. It's so right up my alley. I do. I, I know that you got uh, Ash Costello from New Year's Day 
to do a cameo on the Resident Evil one where she turns into a zombie. She's a good friend of mine. She had, had her on the show and I'm doing a, I invited her to my annual Halloween party, which is back on. We had to stop it last year, but we're back on because it's a big fucking party. I was going to invite you, but you're in fucking Salem in a much cooler spot for this time. Maybe next time. Yeah, maybe next time. That's for sure. Yeah, but Ash is great. She did a great job. And uh, uh, my girlfriend is actually the one in all the videos, too, kind of the, the, the star of the show. Her okay. Ash, I was wondering Ash who that was. I, I was wondering who that was because I watched the behind the scenes of that video, too. And I was like, and I asked her a couple of questions. I was like, is she famous? Like, who is this? And like, and then like, why are they talking to her? <laughs> Not to be rude, but like, who is this and why are they talking to her other than she's the main star of the video, right? And then, uh, and then it, you just filled me in that you're, that's your, your girlfriend. You said, yeah. Yeah. And, and her and Ash were just troopers just rolling around, stabbing each other with fake scissors for about uh, three hours and bleeding <laughs> all over each other. So yeah, they, they were troopers. Troopers. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, a couple of good looking girls, Stabbing each other and bleeding all over each other. It wasn't bad for the career to watch that, right? What's not to love? Right? <laughs> Pure entertainment, right? <laughs> How long have you been with your girlfriend? Uh, a long time, almost 10 years. Oh, wow. Okay, so yeah. is she like the inspiration behind this uh, this 20-year-old fiancé that you've uh, apparently murdered? That's right. And it saves money on the actors. <laughs> kind of got like a go. Rob Zombie, you know, Cherry Moon kind of thing going on i know That's she's awesome. great she's great in it and uh just have to make sure we don't show our parents any of these videos oh is it would, would this be a bad would this be a bad thing for the uh in-laws no i'm just you know seeing her die so many times it's got to be a little bit disturbing to them but the whole premise <laughs> of this overarching story where you know i'm being sort of um you know crucified by the da because they don't really have that much evidence and the evidence of my guilt is that I'm in this sick, twisted fucking metal band with all these evil lyrics. It came from, you know, me thinking like, you know, if Rob Zombie was ever under suspicion of like a person of interest and they didn't really have enough hard evidence to link him to the crime, don't you think the DA would probably at some point, well, look, it's right in his lyrics. Look at these fucking movies he's making. He's twisted and he lost the reality button. So that's, that's what got me thinking about this idea for this sort of overarching story with the album. I love, I love that story right there of, of, of what your muse was for that. Cause that's, that's a, you put yourself in a perspective rather than like, just, I don't, I don't know. Creativity could, could come in so many different ways. Right. As you know, like sometimes it's, it, it's something stupid, like a, a couple of a, a phrase and you're like, Oh, that phrase is brilliant. I'm going to write a song revolving around that phrase, whatever. But you put yourself in a perspective of, of another person I was like, well, how would that pan out? And like, that's more of a storytelling vibe and, and overarching story. And I really respect that. I think that's, those are two very different ways of getting your muse. And I think that's a, that's a really cool way. It shows where you are in life. And I think that's really cool. Thanks, man. And, and also like, you know, going back to the West Memphis, a real case that happened, the West Memphis three, you know, those, those guys that were sort of, um, again, to use the word like crucified and sort of a wild uh, witch hunt. Uh, for the killing of these three young kids and they didn't really have any evidence against them, but the kids wore black clothes and they listened to Metallica and they were the outsiders and uh, they sort of got railroaded because of that. And that was also something else that I was thinking about in terms of the trial portion, which, you know, I hope to cover in, in the full length film. No, I, I, I'm excited. I, I didn't know that there wasn't even an idea for a full length film on it too. So this is, we got to get you in one of the videos now. Dude, I would fucking love it. Are you kidding me? Be I, so I, sick. I, w- I would absolutely kill it. So just so you know, like just yeah. not to toot my own horn or anything. <laughs> yeah. We got to get you in the next one. Dude, I'd love to. Yeah. Hit me up. We'll, we'll, we'll stay in touch after this chat. For yeah, sure. yeah. 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 Uh, hit me up. I'm down. I'm down for just about anything. Uh, me and me and Sinister Gates, uh, well, I'm, I'm stealing his line actually is I'll try anything once. So it's, uh, it's, uh, like it, it goes a little deeper than that, but you know, you, you, you get the idea. <laughs> Uh, I like that. That's a good mantra. <laughs> I'll try anything once. <laughs> Rock and roll. But then you always open yourself up to your group of your guy friends. And you're like, anything? And like, oh, mm-hmm. anything. I'll, anything. I'll try anything twice. You'll try anything twice. Yeah. Oh, there's Spencer went up in me. <laughs> there you go. I never heard that before. I think I'm going to start using that. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, let's go back to comparisons uh, so we could get to know each other's horror uh, ideas a little more. One of the ones that I thought was really funny that my producer gave me was um, uh, Insane Clown Posse or Attack of the Killer Clowns. Oh, well, I think they may have buried the hatchet ICP and Twisted, but I'm good friends with the Twisted guys. So okay, just on a cellular level, I have to go with the Killer Clowns. You know, I don't have a, I don't have a, a dog in the race. Per se, but I'd still go attack the killer clowns because that's a fucking amazing movie. Of course, incredible <laughs> movie. Um, and and I actually really do know a little bit about how, about how how magnets work. So I I want to make sure I let, let everyone know that I, I I did go to school for a little bit of time and I did learn how magnets work. That's perfect. <laughs> and I, and I remember it was directed by the Chiodos brothers, and I remember that band Chiodos hearing that that's how they got their name because they were originally the Chiodos brothers. So there's always that overlap with metal and horror at some point, you know? Oh, absolutely. It goes hand in hand. That's why I just, I, and you know, going back to the comparisons and I, I don't like to name names because it doesn't do anyone any well, but there's been a lot of bands who have tried this overlapping horror with metal and stuff. And on the, con I haven't seen it on the consistent basis that you guys have done, like really gone all in with it, especially on this record and doing an entire concept on it. It's usually just a couple songs here and there. And I feel like that's, that's maybe what has set you guys apart in actually achieving something that other bands have tried to do. They just may not have done it as well. And, you know, how, how can you speak on that? Like is, you probably dabbled with the idea a couple of times before you decided I'm going all in with this, with this horror metal concept. Well, we started um, the idea of doing um, concept records with two albums back. We did um, an album that was based all basically on horror literature and it was called every trick in the book. And it all started from, you know, me writing a song about Jekyll and Hyde, you know, uh, called Me, Myself, and Hyde. And it was the first time I had ever decided to base our songs off an already recognizable thing, you know, mm -hmm. that already had sort of a built-in following. And we tried it on this one song and seemed to really um, pique people's interest, you know, something that got people talking, like, oh, there's this band that does what? And we did it for that whole album, Every Trick in the Book. And, and at the end of the day, it was just so much fun, you know? Um, you know, we did a couple of Stephen King books. Um, we did The Exorcist, which of course is a film, but it's also, you know, originally a novel. And it just seemed like the next logical, natural step to go into film. And um, other than music, films are, are my other great passion, great love. And at the end of the day, it was just so fun to do this kind of writing because I, I know these films and these characters so well, and um, I'm a nostalgic kind of guy, and all this stuff kind of brings me back to my childhood and watching these movies for the first time and the feeling that I got seeing Scream in the movie theater when I was a little kid, 11. You know, I had already the been a fan. Franchise. Love the Scream franchise. So the good. best. And I was already a big slasher fan, but I was too young to have seen Friday the 13th in the theaters, and I was born in, in 85. And um, when I was there in the theater watching Scream in 1996, and I saw the killer talking about Jason and Michael, I was like, this is going to be my favorite shit of all time. The guy on the screen, the killer is talking about yeah. these other killers. Well, not to mention the geek in the, in the blockbuster video, too. I mean, or, or Jamie Kennedy. Randy. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it, 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 uh, to your point, it's just it's such a cool concept that there's – these guys geeking out about the same stuff that I geek out about. And then there's also another killer on top, like to your point, and they're like using that whole idea. I mean, Wes Craven absolutely killed it on that, on that concept. Absolutely. It's just a, a, a genius. I've always been a fan of Wes Craven, Craven. And um, one of the things that kind of always inspired me to keep going um, when, you know, times were tough or we couldn't get a record deal or, you know, we weren't getting tours is going back to the story of the fact that Wes Craven couldn't get anyone interested in uh, producing Nightmare on Elm Street because all the big film studios told him that no one was interested in movies about dreams. So he went on to partner with this other very small studio 
and they produced Nightmare on Elm Street. And that studio was New Line uh, Cinema, yep. which became, you know, Lord of the Rings, a multi-billion dollar corporation, and uh, was, you know, has been always referred to now as the house that Freddie built. So Wes Craven um, has that kind of punk rock DIY uh, attitude that um, always kind of kept me inspired when, you know, the band wasn't doing so great. Well, no one believed that Freddy Krueger would, would, would be anything. So uh, it's always a cool story that I, I go back to. Yeah, I love that. That's, that's a really cool, that's a, that's a cool one to keep your, keep your focus, right? I mean, that's, that, that's, a, that's a rad one to go back to. We, you mentioned Scream, so I got to bring up, I mean, I think I already know the answer to this one because we just went off about Wes Craven and Scream. But it's a good segue. We go Scream or I, I Know What You Did Last Summer. Scream, 100%. I like I Know What You Did Last Summer a lot. Um, and if you think about, um, you know, the relationship of, Hall of Halloween to Friday the 13th, you know, even the, the writers of Friday the 13th have unashamedly say, said that, you know, we were just trying to knock off Halloween. We're trying to rip off Halloween because it came right in its way. So I know what you did last summer was kind of that to, to Scream, you know, came out very soon after. Kevin Williamson, who wrote Scream, uh, worked on the script. Um, but yeah, Scream is like my all time favorite. And uh, we actually did an acoustic set in Sue's house, the end of Scream, you know, that big party scene. Uh, we did this event called Scream Comes Home and the house is exactly as it was in the movie. And we played a little acoustic set in the garage where Rose McGowan's character dies. Dies, yeah, she gets caught in the uh, in the dog door that comes out. It, it's funny, uh, so you've been to that house. They, I just saw on David Arquette's uh, uh, Instagram last month that it's now open for Airbnb. Yeah. I, I'm Crazy. doing this. I'm fucking doing to. this. I'm going to the fucking house and staying. Like, uh, we're grab grabbing a few of our friends and we're going up there. Um, uh, hopefully you're around. Maybe you, maybe you stop by and, and 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 we hang out for a little bit in uh, the place where Rose McGowan was killed. I would love to, man. I mean, it's in a beautiful wine country. You know, it's in Santa Rosa. Yeah, dude. That's so, that. That was that was another thing that like really sold me on it. I was like, uh, you know, kind of horror wine buds. I, I'm I'm fucking down. Like whatever. Let's go. You will have an amazing time. The house is dope. That whole area is so dope. You'll love it. So let's go. Let's go to another one. Um, within its own franchise, Evil Dead One and Two or Army of Darkness. Oh man, I think I'm going to have to give it to Army of Darkness because I actually saw that in the theater with my dad. You saw Army of Darkness saw, in the theater? Yeah, I think that's is that ninety four or, or is it either earlier ninety two? You know, I didn't see it until until later. Um, Later in my life, probably when I was a teenager, a little bit later. So I don't know. We're similar in age. So although you look much younger, everyone we are similar in age. <laughs> it's the lotion I use a lot of. You know, like Patrick Bateman. I, I use lotion, like but no it's alcohol. not on my face. <laughs> there you go. With the tissues and whatnot. <laughs> my cock yeah, looks. My cock looks super young. Let me yeah, tell you. Yeah, yeah. Look a day over twenty five. Uh, but yeah, my dad and my mom were very cool about me seeing those movies, and I remember seeing in the theater and you know putting that chainsaw on, uh, replacing his hands. And it's funny because Bill Mosley, uh, who you know we've been talking about, has been in our videos. He he's in Army of Darkness. He plays one of you, you would never recognize him, but he's he plays one, one of the knights or something. Yeah, well, one of the the um, the, ske the skeleton knights, you know, like the evil ones. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 See, I lean towards Army. Of, I didn't see it in theaters, but I lean towards Army of Darkness because it goes back to my brand of horror. I appreciate the more the, the more serious the uh, the the more reality based horror as well. I appreciate that. But when I'm going to watch a movie over and over, it's got to be more like an Army of Darkness. It's going to be more of like I could find little funny things wrapped around it. I like I like the satirical uh, aspect of horror. And that's just kind of like like my vibe. Me too. I, I mean, I like the serious ones too, but you know, that's why I'm so drawn to American Psycho just Yo, because it's so sharp. Movie. Dude. I, when I first saw that movie, it, it blew me away. Like lines, like it's not going to eat itself. Uh, you know, it's like, Oh, it's, oh, it's so brilliant. And then like, remove your dress. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to call you Sabrina. <laughs> Phil Collins. 
<laughs> uh, his playing became more apparent. You could uh, almost hear, practically hear the nuance of every single instrument. Remove and then the, the, the psychosis and, and the, the narcissism of when he sees, and, and, and Christian Bale does such a great job of when he sees that card that's dropped that looks better than his card. Oh my God, that scene had me fucking dying. And the guy's like, Patrick, are you okay? You're sweating. <laughs> he's just like impressive. Yeah, he's so <laughs> mad about it. Just so fucking mad. And what the are dramatic some dramatic music? I mean, it's just such a brilliantly shot scene. And uh, what's so funny about it? You know, obviously the book and the movie got a lot of flack for being, you know, misogynistic. And the, the insane thing is that American Psycho, the film, was not only directed by a woman, but a screen, a, a woman, two women wrote the screenplay. So the people that. It, you know, accuse it of being misogynistic, it's supposed to show how shitty that is. You know what I mean? So it's like when people criticize it for that. Like, oh, well, you know, Spencer, you're just, you're expecting way too much for people. Everything goes over, over everyone's head. You know true. that. You're, that's you're a creator. You're an artist. Everything goes over everybody's head. I saw some, one of the funniest things about our album that went over, this guy said he was giving the album a, a bad review and he was talking about the part in, America, in our American Psycho song about when I'm doing the uh, Huey Lewis part, and that he was like, Yeah, he's talking about his own band and talking about how great their influence. It was the most narcissistic thing I've ever <laughs> heard. I'm like, Thank you, sir. Good night. Hey, no hey, he, he got it on a, on a very low level. He understood a little bit of, uh, but he just didn't get the joke or, or the homage, which is so many, has so many more layers. So, so he just, he did, he's, he's a crust kind of guy. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't deal with everything on top. It was so funny. I loved hearing that. I was like, that is pretty good, man. Sometimes you that. get those great ones. Those are those are the fun ones. Like when someone like goes out of the way, have you seen this review? This one's fucking hilarious. Those are the ones I love. Well, you gotta <laughs> laugh at it. And, and also, it's like, you know, you just obviously have to have a thick skin. And for me, it's like all the movies that I love, most of the horror movies always got shat on by the press. So it's like, keep them coming. It's just, it's just funny to me. I love it. Yeah, well, even like the... I watched uh, the new Halloween Kills last week. Have you seen it yet? Loved it. I loved it as well for numerous reasons. So I, it starts out right where uh, we'll, we'll, we'll fucking give away the plot. You guys have had plenty of time to get Paramount and fucking watch it. Um, like, so it, it starts out and um, it picks off uh, off the other Danny McBride produced one from the, the, the last one. Mm -hmm. And it starts off like pretty fucking serious. And like, I'm like, okay, this is gonna be rad. I notice as I hit play, I'm, I, I'm, I'm digressing here a little bit, a 49% on Rotten Tomatoes. And I was like, okay, I'm probably going to like this movie. And then uh, it, it continues on and then it continually got further and further away from the actor's plot and the editing in it that I was like, now it's feeling like a horror movie. I was like, yes, now, like you guys, it was a little polished for the first 20 minutes, but then now we're really starting to feel like a horror movie again. And that's when I was just, you know, moments where you start laughing, the chick pulls out a gun, the door gets slammed and she still sh manages to pull the trigger and shoot herself. <laughs> like, it's, <laughs> that's, like so good, that's a fucking horror movie. That's what I want to see. Uh, and then of course, Mike Myers having the, the burnt up uh, side of his face and stuff. Like, I mean, what was your favorite uh, movie out of the Halloween franchise? I mean, we were talking about Rob Zombie doing it. Now we're talking about Danny McBride, yeah, John Carpenter. Um, not necessarily the directors and creators of it, but what, 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 which one really spoke to you out of the, out of all the movies? Because I have the Man, one in my head. It's it's so hard to say. How the original Halloween was the first horror movie I ever saw. You know, when wow. I would go to the video store as a little kid, drawn to that aisle that said horror, and the the, the VHS covers drew me in, and especially that yes. that pumpkin with the butcher knife. What is this? I want to see what the hell. Can you see that? You got it, man. I don't know if you that. Sorry, sorry for me to know what, what the camera's picking up these days. Uh, but yeah, that, that that imagery drew me in. And so I have a, a, a great affection for the first two. I kind of always think of one and two as one and the same, just because it's the same night. It's in the hospital. Like everyone, you know, three, I, I, I couldn't stand initially. I, like, I appreciate it now as its own horror movie, but it, it doesn't have Michael. So I was never really interested in it. Um, man, I, it, it's so hard for me, but um, I think I always got to go back to one and two. Um, six to me, I love the mask. 
that's like where they started to get the mask right again because four and five the mask was so whack true um uh i really loved i loved h2o because it felt very scream like you know kevin williamson kind of devised the story who wrote Scream. totally agree and and the return of jamie lee curtis at the time so great um i hated resurrection that's the only one that i like loathe it was like the one with buster rhymes and it was just like a found footage i love shit. buster rhymes but i don't think i've seen this one i might i might I'll have avoided it, it but because i mean i love Buster. i don't know about you i love buster too i love Buster in movies too like higher burning he's so oh, good dude, so good. yeah he's so good but it just wasn't it wasn't right i really what is the I snoop really, dog movie i rented a snoop uh, i'm sorry to dig it yes bones that movie so okay so we're a year removed from each other i'm 36 or 35 84 85 uh we've been talking about the 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 VHS covers and going and renting these movies. For me, it was like a weekly tradition. I went with a couple of buddies and we literally just, well, this looks ridiculous. I have to get this horror movie. Let's go back and have some pizza and watch this, this horror movie. And that was like the week, the weekly thing that we did. What was it for you? Did, did, did you have a similar experience uh, renting the videos just based on, as you said, based on the cover, but like sometimes you go for, well, this movie looks cool. And sometimes you go, well, this movie looks fucking ridiculous. I want to get this one too. No, absolutely. I mean, you know, I always would frequent um, my local Blockbuster and some of the other local mom and pop shops. But I think um, always uh, I fondly remember vacations to, to Florida, to Boca Raton. I would go on with my cousin's family. And every night that was the ritual to go out and pick out the next Friday the 13th. Um, but I think... Uh, I remember my uncle got in a lot of trouble because I think we were like super, super young and he let us watch um, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre part two. Ooh, and, and part two is the worst one. The part two is like the craziest one. I was just talking to Tech Knight about this yesterday, who was uh, who's done some stuff with you before as well. I literally just had him on the show yesterday. It'll release after this <laughs> one. But we were just talking about how fucked up the second one was, in, even in comparison to its own franchise. So fucked up. I mean, and like the whole yuppies death scene in the car. And um, I just remember, and I wish I had saved it because when this is like when I was in kindergarten, I got this report card and the teacher was saying, said something like Spencer claims to have seen the Texas Chainsaw Massacre part two and is scaring all the kids during recess. I wish I saved it a fucking report card. But she didn't believe that I had seen it. But to come full circle all those years later and then be working with Bill Mosley, who's chop top, and that is just so yeah. funny to me. But um, yeah, it was amazing, always such an amazing usual. story. And I will say, I 1000% believe it without you even doing that because I had a similar story. I have two older brothers, and they would have like the horror nights for their birthdays and stuff, watch uh, Friday, Friday the 13th, uh, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. And from the townhouse that I grew up in, I could see the TV from the top of the stairs. So my parents didn't know. And I was about four or five years old watching every single horror movie every weekend. So I'd sneak out of bed and watch from, from above. So I'd, and I'd go to school and tell everyone about fucking Freddy and Jason. And they're like, there's no way this kid has seen it. And then they'd, they'd be like, no. <laughs> and my wife, my, my mom to this day was still like, so you didn't see it that early. I'm like, my, I stood at the top of the stairs and watched every bit of it. <laughs> I was about five years old. If only they knew, right? Speaking of the top of the stairs, I asked you about your favorite Halloween one. Now I got to interject and oh, talk yeah. about my head. I agree. Oh, yeah. I think six is has always been the one for me. I agree that the originals are always going to be the originals. But something about uh, I forget the actress's name when she plays uh, 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 the the niece and cut and is standing at the top of the stairs in the clown outfit still. Oh yeah, yeah. Danielle Harris. That's right. Um, something about the way that one ended. And, and just the way it built up, even uh, at the time uh, of its release, I remember like it was one of the ones that actually shocked me. Like this, a storyline in a horror movie that late in the franchise that actually shocked me. I was like, "Oh, this is this is fucking pretty cool." It was badass, and uh, I, I love that particular scene you're talking about because it, you know, it mirrors the the opening of part one. You know, she puts on the clown mask, and you see it from the POV through the eye holes of the clown mask, and she stabs her, her mother. And, and Loomis's dialogue in that one is so good. I mean, he's just so funny. They're talking about him as if he were a human being. That part <laughs> of him died years ago. 
He's just so funny, Donald Pleasance. Man, we definitely need to hang out because you reminded like as I'm talking to you and we're having this virtual hang right now, I'm realizing number one, you know the quotes way better than I do. So you're even more of a nerd about horror than I am. Number two, it's bringing me back. Like as you're quoting, I'm going like, yeah, that was the fucking line. Like I, I, it's, uh, it's back there somewhere. It's back there fucking somewhere. I've drinking most of it away, but it's back there somewhere. Yeah, man. I was always, I was always the kid among my friend group that quoted all the movies verbatim and not just horror, like, all kinds of movies. And I, I, I got, I got, I got people. one that I quote uh, to an annoying level. You, no one wants to watch the movie with me because I quote it before every line before it happens while you're watching the movie with me. What is it? Tombstone. Tombstone. I don't know that one as well as you do, but that's got so some, what, what, some what, What's one of the ones for you? What's one of one like? What's a movie that people can't stand to watch with you because you can't help but quote it as you're watching? Oh, it? a few good men. The whole courtroom scene. Wow. What are we going to discuss next, Danny? My favorite color? I mean, that whole scene right there. I mean, we got time. Um, you can just go through the whole scene right now. If you're no, we'll just do the whole scene right well, now. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll clip it out later as, as, as Spencer from Ice Nine Kills gives us a few good men uh, 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 which are, uh, reading. Yeah. All, all I'm saying is that you were, you, you, you were leaving for two days, you packed an overnight bag, and you made three phone calls. Private Santiago was leaving for the rest of his life, and he hadn't packed a thing. He hadn't called a soul. Can you explain that? My answer is I don't have a first damn clue. Maybe he was an early riser and liked to pack in the morning. And maybe he didn't have any friends. That's all I got. See. Oh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much. The man is hired. He's, he's, he's 20 years too late for the job, but he, he's definitely hired. <laughs> I appreciate that. If they do, if they do a remake, I'd love it's to longer play than twenty years. Santiago. Actually, now that I just did the math in my head, like I just threw out twenty years and I did the math in my head, a few good men was a lot longer than twenty years ago. I think so. That might have been ninety. Ninety. It's, it's early to mid nineties. I, I don't have it up the. You know, that that's the difference that's, of running this show myself. I don't get to go to like some some guys sitting on the wait. wait hey, when is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's ninety two. Like a Baba Boo. 92. It was 92. So it was, a, it was a year after the Black Album. Oh, there you go. See, that? that then I know time. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure Colonel Nathan R. Jessup was a huge uh, Hetfield fan back then. Every, who wasn't? Who wasn't? Who wasn't, right? Who isn't? Who isn't to this day? I mean, have you, have you seen the performances, uh, any clips from the performance of Louder Than Life and the Aftershock uh, Festival that Metallica just headlined? Like they did we played the night before, and I woke up in the morning um, and saw all of their pyro set up, you know, branded with the Metallica. It wasn't just rented gear, you know, Metallica obviously has oh, their yeah. own pyro. And I was just like, God, that's the dream. Got to get to that level with, the, with my Dude, have, have you had the pleasure of meeting any of those guys yet? I've never met them. I did see them on the Load Album Cycle live um, in Boston uh, at the. Garden. I saw that same. I saw that same fucking show in LA at the at the Forum. That was my first. I was eleven years old. It was my first ever real concert. Was really? uh, was Metallica on the Load tour with Corn as main support? Oh, I didn't get Corn. So maybe it was a different tour of the same album cycle. It might have been. Well, you know, you know they do legs. Like in, at the time, you right. just go out. They go across the world like that. But they they yeah. mix in different legs. Now that now that we've both been in the industry, you understand that. But like, yeah. So uh, who so was good. who was main support for? I don't, uh, unless we got there late and 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 I missed corn. But from what I remember, there was there was like no opening support. But I do remember like there was something where they pretended like all the lights went off and. Um, and, and, and then some like um, working lights came down and they did uh, the rest of the set like that. I don't know if that happened. No, that was but, exactly what happened. They, they had like the, the, the pseudo stunt guy climb one of the scaffoldings and then they yes. blast, blast off pyro and he falls over and like they stop the show for a second. And then it, just James comes out with the one light. And he's like, oh, is everyone okay out there? And he starts talking about it. And yes. then they move the big ass stage to this really small, intimate little lit thing in this very center of, this, of the arena. And I've always loved that moment because I was like, this is one of the coolest fucking things I've seen in so long. Or Dude, ever we're, we're at like, that uh, point, I was 11 years old. That was the coolest fucking thing I've ever seen. We're soulmates here. We've seen all the same shows. Yeah. Um, 
it's like, uh, and I remember that night so uh, vividly. I remember like Lars coming out in his underwear or something. He's drinking a beer, kind of looking yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. He takes his seat, and it was just like, man. And and that must have been what? When did Load come out? Ninety six, ninety five. Yeah. Uh, fuck. Well, I'm thirty six. I was eleven then. So. Yeah, ninety six. Someone else do them? Yeah, yeah. Because I was ninety like four. Um, it would have been like ninety five, ninety six. Yeah. And until so yeah. it sleeps, I, that was at the time when I, they had taken the hiatus and every one of my, like my dad who, who raised me on metal and all of his friends, all long hair metal fans. Like as soon as you cut your hair at that time, you were no longer metal. Like that was just, that was the thing in the mid nineties. If you cut your fucking hair, you were not metal. So yeah, they got comes crucified. Back out. what's that? They got crucified. They absolutely didn't. It's like the songs are trash. The songs are trash. And like, now you go back and it's like load and reload still constant songs in the set list because people fucking love them i mean uh until it sleeps was an amazing fucking song when it came out like i was i was blown away like of course i loved metallica for their stuff before but like when until it sleeps it i was like how can anyone deny that metallica doesn't have it anymore like they only went I agree. Out. and it was so funny they'd only been on a hiatus for like six years i think we've been on a hiatus for four years at this point so <laughs> it's, it's not that big of a deal and you guys already have the short hair, so you're you're ahead of me, right? Well, I, my my short hair is by uh, by necessity. I can't grow my hair out. You know, I, I I've got a four year. See, this is why you look younger than me. You could only be a year younger than me, but like you don't have a kid yet, do you? <laughs> no, not that I know. of. No, <laughs> that's a great answer right there. Uh, only try things twice. <laughs> <laughs> but that for me is uh, I, I that's always my excuse. After having my son, I aged like fucking at least 10 years right right away you have one kid i have one kid yeah that's awesome again one that i know of i've used one it that you know of yeah yeah you used to, <laughs> you used to have a mohawk right you used to i still do mohawk. it's under there somewhere oh there you go well i haven't had um, truth be told i couldn't get to my barber before this episode otherwise i would have had a, my mohawk going but i do a lazy hawk now i do a lazy hawk now i'm i'm flip. I'm, I'm too old i do the flip i don't like putting it up is a fucking pain in the ass these days I don't have Viagra. It's fucking. <laughs> Cialis is the liquid gold, as they say. I heard blue chew is um, the way to go. I don't know. Is it? I don't know. Is that the one from the 7 Eleven? I don't. I, you know, I listen to a lot of wrestling, professional wrestling podcasts, and they always seem to be advertising there. I think there's probably a correlation in the uh, demographic, but uh, it's, it's a chewable, apparently, instead of. Uh, an actual like you have to wait for it to to kick in. It cooks in. It kicks in faster. It gets the bloodstream faster. I don't know. I haven't tried it, Spencer. I'm just saying this is what the, the advertisements I hear say about well, it. Well, let me know how it goes. We'll <laughs> check it out. Yeah, yeah. That stuff can't be good for you. If they saw yeah. the 7-Eleven right at the register, you're probably gonna die. Well, you know, I mean, that's that's a fair point. That's a that's a very fair. Point. Anything they're advertising with a rhinoceros as the mascot that says rock hard. Probably stay away from. But I mean, a rhinoceros seems to be pretty rock hard. I mean, yeah, especially from uh, what well, Ace Ventura too when he's stuck in a rhinoceros. Yes, I'm so glad you went there because I was thinking the exact same fucking thing. Kind of hot these rhinos, <laughs> that. dude. That scene, I watched that movie for the first time in the theaters, going back to movies <laughs> with just me and my mother. And I watched Ace Ventura 2, and it was, at first, the most awkward thing. I think I was about, I must have been, what, 11, 10 years old, something like that. But still enough to know what the fuck was going on, right? Yeah, yeah. And there's, like, the gorilla scene where the guy get, is getting fucking fucked in the, in the jungle by a gorilla. And then, of course, the scene <laughs> you're just talking about, Jim Carrey coming out of the asshole of a fucking rhinoceros. Or, oh, everything that he does, comedic fucking genius. Actually, just kind of life genius, if you've seen him on a... Uh, Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld's uh, Comedians with Cars Getting Coffee. If you haven't, go watch that. He's, he's, a, he's a brilliant human being. I, I love that show, but I don't think I've seen the Jim Carrey one. And I love Jim Carrey. And he's yeah. a metal fan. You know, obviously, the only reason yeah. Cannibal Corpse was in the first Ace Ventura was because of, of him. And he was, I've heard Cannibal Corpse talking about it. He was like, not just like, oh, they're a metal band. Let's get them in. He was like a real fan, like asking them which song they were going to play, like knew the vile record, like knew everything. That's so cool. I love those stories, man. Um, I think I've taken up enough of your time. Uh, you, you, you're uh, at your hotel. You're going to go get some witchcraft over in Salem tonight or what? I think we might, you know, 
as they call it, call, call the corners. It's not something from like the craft movie will get crazy. Ooh, craft movie. That's a good one. That's a, That's good a great one. We are, we are the weirdos, sir. Yeah, great one. <laughs> but thanks for having me on, man. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, 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 man. Uh, let's let's keep in touch. We'll do this again. We'll talk a little bit more another time. Um, but uh, again, everyone go check out the new Ice Nine Kills record. It's out everywhere. It's been out for a week now, probably two by the time we release this. But uh, still really cool, man. Oh, and enjoy uh, your tour in November with uh, my friends from uh, Fame on Fire. You get, those guys are going to be opening for you, right? Super nice guys. They were on the first leg of our tour, too, so we got to know them a little bit. They introduced me to some uh, really weird Florida drinks. So uh, uh, ask them to show you as well if they haven't already. I would like that. It's, it's right, filled man. with Cialis and Viagra, I'm sure. <laughs> blue Chew, Blue Chew. You got to get the Blue Chew in there. I'm, I'm looking for sponsors, Spencer. You don't, you don't understand that yet. If you uh, want to endorse me, I'll do it. <laughs> All right, man. I had, I had a great time with you today, and uh, let's keep in touch. We'll talk soon, brother. Definitely, man. Thanks a lot. All right, cheers.